And here we go. All right, so um, we're back after some technical difficulties. Uh, Zach speaking to us again, this is part two. Um, so Zach, all yours. Cool. All right, so let's do a quick flyby from last time. Uh, there are a couple things I wanted to make sure everybody's aware because I'm constantly updating this sucker. So one of the things I'm going to point out is that after all of this stuff that we've already seen, of course, you can see I've added a bibliography. That's going to be evident in some of the slides that are up and coming today or next time, depending upon what we talk about. The other thing is that I added a little note here. It should be said in all fairness that I am taking most of this presentation directly out of Crandall Ishi Lyons. I'm doing my own particular take on it. I'm making sure everybody gets the full explanations. I'm adding um, content here so nobody can claim that I'm a moocher. But on the other hand, most of it's already there. So if you want to see the full, beautiful technical version, you can click on this little link right here and it will take you directly to a version that's hosted at Pitt University. Uh, I don't know why that makes it a better version, except that the archive version has a stupid little archive logo on the outside and it's not aesthetically pleasing to me. Okay, so let's see, what did we cover last time? Because we covered a whole bunch of stuff. So we talked about what it meant for a function to be uh, proper and degenerate elliptic which is really important here. If you don't have a properness and degenerate ellipticity, the viscosity theory just does not work. So we must have this, it's a base assumption. We talked about some types of operators. Uh, we talked about what it meant to be in the jets, which we found out could be talked about using matrices and vectors, but is much easier to talk about when we use test functions or uh, really touching above and touching below functions, as you see in this picture here. The fact of the matter is that whenever I have touching above and touching below functions, like the ones that you see in this picture, even if function u is not differentiable at the points x or y, um, I say x in both cases because I can, this is my presentation. If you don't like it, make your own presentation. But even if u is not differentiable at those points, we can replace the derivatives of u by the derivatives of phi or psi, and that will do for us. We characterize all the touching above and touching below functions as you see here. And it turns out that the jets that we talked about last time, the collections of estimates for the derivatives, both first and second order, can be thought of as just ordered pairs of gradients and hessians for touching above or touching below functions. All nice, useful stuff. We talked about what we mean when we say a viscosity super solution and a viscosity subsolution, also a viscosity solution. It should be noted that whenever you have a viscosity solution, it is both a sub and a super solution by definition. We talked about some quick and easy notes that you can take away from the definition of viscosity solutions, which are that uh, viscosity solutions are continuous at the very least. If you have a classical solution, then of course it is also a viscosity solution. And anytime you have a viscosity solution that has non-empty jets, upper and lower at a single point that intersect, then that intersection will consist of only one point. And that one point, the ordered pair A to X will actually be the derivatives for our function at X naught. Hopefully all this is at least vaguely familiar. Now, this next section that we're getting into is where we actually allow the rubber to meet the road. It's where we're going to meet both Fudong's and Nathan's comments head on because they had some absolutely fantastic comments from last time, which were in effect, how do you know whether or not the jet is going to be non-empty? Because if you have a non-empty jet, well, it's kind of trivially a solution. Usually, and I'll go ahead and talk about this now as soon as I can get a pen to work with me. And there it is. Generally speaking, we only care about the viscosity solution if uh, we have a jet. So, and this is an important note, if a jet, I'm gonna say the upper jet, but it could be any one of the jets, is empty, trivially, a viscosity solution at that point. We don't care about points where there are no jet entries. We only care about points where there are jet entries. Uh, and that's where we're going to be spending a lot of time today is trying to figure out how to guarantee there are jet entries. If there aren't jet entries, we can't do any of the stuff that we want to do today. So this is kind of important. 
Okay, so as we talked about last time also, a lot of times the sorts of problems we're interested in, at least in the beginning, since we're dealing with eh, not really elliptic operators, but something relatively close, are Dirichlet type problems using our continuous proper degenerate elliptic operators. They'll look like what you have on the screen here. And our goal right now is going to be to figure out circumstances under which we can say, okay, if we have a viscosity subsolution, let's call that U. We have a viscosity super solution, call that V. We know, and that serves me right for switching away from the pen. We know that if U is less than or equal to V on the boundary of our set, that we want to be able to carry that inequality to the inside so that we'll have a comparison principle of some kind. It'll look kind of like the ellipticity theory that we're used to. So the question is, what do we need to introduce to our situation in order to guarantee that this condition here translates into this condition here? Everybody cool with that so far? I see some approving faces. Brittany decided to take her face off of the video for unknown reasons. Oh, my bad. I suspect she's shy. <laughs> or maybe she's hoping this time I can't read her facial expression. You got me. <laughs> I'm like that today. This is what happens when my water goes out. I become this man. I'm fearsome, <laughs> like a honey badger. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we have here this very simple, very, very simple little result that we like to call the maximum principle. And it says the following, forget about viscosity solutions. Let's just worry about upper and lower semi-continuity. If I have upper and lower semi-continuous functions, U and V, if I define M alpha to be the supremum of U minus V minus the alpha over two times the distance between points X and Y, where I take X and Y in the closures of O cross O for every single positive alpha. And if I suppose that M alpha is finite, well, at least not a positive infinity for large values of alpha. And if I suppose that there is a sequence X alpha, Y alpha of ordered pairs, so that as I let alpha go to infinity, the difference of M alpha and u of x alpha minus v of x alpha minus alpha over two, the distance between x alpha and y alpha squared is equal to zero, then I get two outputs. One is that alpha over two, the distance between x alpha and y alpha squared goes to zero as alpha goes to infinity. And the second is that the limit of m alpha is actually going to be the supremum of u of x minus v of x, which if x naught happens to be a limit point in our set O of X alpha also happens to be U of X alpha, uh, U of X naught minus a V of X naught. Trivial, right? Now I've provided a short version of the proof here. It literally just fits on one page when you see it in this version, but I suspect this is a bit too condensed. I put it here for completeness sake and also so that we can intimidate to all of those people who didn't decide to show up to the seminar to download this later. We can flex on all those people. However, I think probably it is worth our time to see actually how this proof works, if you guys are interested. So for those purposes, I have my notebook of science, kind of like Bill Nye, except not crazy. Well, not Bill Nye crazy. Okay, so let's do the proof. Of maximum principle. Which because I am a slovenly person I'm going to abbreviate to max prince. You are welcome to make jokes because I'm going to do so. So, first of all. Let's go ahead and pull over pictures of what I was talking about just a second ago, because without those pictures, we are nothing. We're going to need our definitions, because hopefully those definitions are going to help us somehow, dubiously.
And look, guys, here's another flex. I can paste pictures directly into my notes. You could teach Dima something. I could teach Dima something. Probably how to swear like a sailor. Although, actually, knowing Dima, he probably knows how to do that already. So, first of all, from the definition below, the sequence of values M alpha is decreasing. Would you guys consider that an obvious enough statement to skate over, or do you want to actually talk about that? Nathan seems happy with it. Fudong, you okay with this? Decreasing with respect to what? To alpha. So that's a good point. Let's go ahead and add that in there. It's really only parameterized in alpha, which is handy for us, because if it was parameterized in X and Y and alpha, this would be a pain in the butt. Instead, we parameterize it only in alpha, and it is decreasing with respect to alpha. Brittany, I'm going to pick on you now because I can't see your face, so I get to pick on you more. Do you understand where we're going here? Is everything cool so far? So cool, she's speechless. Yes, this is Brittany, and I understand everything. Well, okay then. Looks like we're going to be moving on. So that's the first thing. We're going to be interested in this decreasing property in just a second. But for right now, what we're going to do is we're going to make another really quick observation. As DJ Khaled might say, another one. It would also be helpful if I could spell here. I say this to my students all the time. They don't have any comment, probably because they know at this point it's inevitable. So another observation for us. For each and every single alpha, M alpha is always greater than or equal to the supremum. We're just going to take this over O this time of U of X minus V of X. This has to be true because if you allow X and Y to be identical in this little definition up here, then the distance portion goes away. And so all we're left with at that point is U of X minus V of X. So we have a decreasing function with respect to alpha. We also know that it is bounded below by whatever the supremum of U of X minus V of X is. So ideally we want to be able to say that it is actually going to converge to something as alpha goes to infinity. The question is, will it do that? Because from our definitions of upper and lower semi-continuous functions, it's not immediately clear that the supremum is going to be finite. I think I can definitely say that u of x minus v of x is not going to be positive infinity. And I'll make this a little note right here. I have a lot of colons in here. It actually kind of... Uh, doesn't correspond at all to our meeting. We have very few colons, relatively speaking. If we had more people in the meeting, we'd have more colons. Nathan gets it. <laughs> I like colon jokes. He's a colon man. What can we say? U of x minus v of x must be less than positive infinity. Does everybody buy this, or do you want an explanation for why that must be true? Uh, I have a question about the M alpha greater than soup, your observation. Okay. Because you, you get rid of this negative thing, should it be bigger, right? Oh, but I'm not getting rid of it. What I'm doing, since I'm allowing the supremum to be taken over values in closure of O cross closure of O, any time that I take any values in O cross O, M alpha is greater than or equal to that. So if I just happen to take X equals Y like this, then automatically alpha over two, the distance between X and Y 
square oh, I see. I is see. zero. I see. So it just disappears. It's a, okay, it's a smaller set. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is why it's really a good idea to take this particular lemma apart, because the authors assure us in their own words that this is really quite trivial and elementary, and you shouldn't be troubled by it at all. And while they don't say it, it's heavily implied that you must be incredibly dumb if you don't know how to figure this out. However, it is incredibly dense. It is a very dense little lemma. Even their proof that they give later on for a related but not identical lemma is dense. So it is worth going through. Heck, I spent actually the last about week double checking all the details just to make sure that I had something I could reliably deliver to everybody here. Okay, so getting back to my first point right here, is everybody willing to buy the idea that the supremum is going to be less than positive infinity? Well, let's see why. Going back to the presentation and the, the really, really short proof really quickly. One of our assumptions right here, which I'm going to underline if ever Zoom works with me, but Zoom doesn't like to work with me, so there you have it. Could be a very long wait. Is that M alpha must be less than positive infinity. So if M alpha is less than positive infinity, it follows at once that the supremum of u of x minus v of x should not be equal to positive infinity. Because if it was, then we were never, ever, ever going to get a finite, in any sense, m alpha. So I'm just going to go ahead and flip back to my proof real quick, and I'm going to add that in as a quick thing, because I'm going to assume, hasty man that I am, that this makes perfect sense. Okay, so that's promising. We're not getting a, an infinite, a positive infinite supremum. So now here's the second question. Could the supremum be negative infinity? So actually, I'm going to leave that to you guys to think about for a second and let me know what you think. Because this was the part that caused me to really scratch my head for a little while before I came up with an answer. Could it be negative infinity? And at this point, if anybody wants to just talk, you can open up your mic. Don't feel like you're gonna interrupt me. I'll let you know by shouting some kind of something if I really wanna speak. Maybe I'll write something strange on the screen. So U is upper semicontinuous, V is lower semicontinuous, yeah? Correct. And what was O? O is um O is just open. Open set, okay. So does that make so then U minus V is what? U is upper semicontinuous, so the U minus V is upper semicontinuous as well. Correct. And is it a fact that a person may continuous function attains its minimum or is it the other way around? You can conclude it if you have a, a compact set. Upper and lower semi-continuity work okay. nicely with, with compact, but here okay. we don't necessarily have that. So. And hopefully you'll agree with me when I say that if uh, U of X minus V of X was constantly negative infinity, it still would technically uh, affirm the definition of upper semi-continuous. Yeah, that would be fine. It would be dumb, but it would be fine. So then I don't see any reason why not for two. Okay. So if so, U of X equals negative infinity or V of X must equal to infinity at each x in O. This has to be the case because otherwise we wouldn't be getting these infinite values. So 
This becomes the problem then. When I'm taking u of x minus v of x, uh, v of y, let's say, like this, minus alpha over 2, x minus y. And actually, I may have to come back and consider this. I want to say that at each point, this is negative infinity. But for some reason, I'm having a memory that tells me that this is not quite what I want to say. Why is this a problem? Oh. No, maybe, I don't know. This is problematic for me. So you can see why I'm having, you can see why I wanted to talk about this with you guys. This is one of those theorems, one of those lemmas, according to them, which really is very, very tricky to work your way through. And I had an answer up until I started getting ready for today. I'm gonna blame it all on Zoom since I had to fight Zoom in order to get to this point. So let me see, does this make sense? Well, I could choose u. It's possible that I could choose u of x to be that way, and I could choose u of x to be that way. Oh. Oh, yes, this is true. This is a true statement. I'm so great. Everybody bow down to me somewhere, somehow. You don't have to show me. I'll just assume you're doing it already. Saves time. This is a true statement. And there's a good reason for this, because the moment that I say, for example, u of x is equal to negative infinity, as Nathan pointed out, u of x is upper semi-continuous. Well, the only way that an upper semi-continuous function takes the value negative infinity is if around that point, it's going to be negative infinity. It has to be. If you weren't negative infinity everywhere around that point, then you would fail to satisfy your uh, upper semi-continuity properties. So at every single point in O, every time that I pick a point, if U of X is negative infinity at that point, around that point, U is also going to be negative infinity. And the same thing happens for V. If V happens to be infinity because it's lower semi-continuous, then everywhere around that point, V has got to be equal to infinity. Otherwise, lower semi-continuity falls apart. As a consequence of that, it means that every single point, we're going to end up finding out that we're going to have either, either one of them be negative infinity. Well, one of them be infinity, one of them be negative infinity, and the difference is going to have to be negative infinity, which is a problem for us. In a situation like this, we would break our rule. So I'm going to write here, the easiest way to explain that is because of upper semi-continuity slash lower semi-continuity. And, and now I'm gonna post a new picture in here just to remind me of how I got to this point. I like to pretend that I do this for your benefit, but this is just as much for my benefit as yours. Otherwise I'm going to forget somewhere in the middle how I got somewhere. And then I'll have to make excuses involving Zoom. Wouldn't that be embarrassing? So, as a consequence of this, the supremum of u of x minus v of x is finite. Hopefully everybody agrees with me up until now, because now we have another important point upcoming, but I'm gonna wait just one second. I'm gonna give people a chance to disagree with me. Now, last time, as you guys will probably remember, I spent a lot, a lot of time in treating you to disagree with me and to ask questions a lot because I was not completely ready. This week, I am closer to completely ready, but still not quite. I'm within epsilon. So if you feel like being argumentative today, today is your day. 
argue away. Also will stop me from turning into Dr. Seuss, at least I hope. So to clarify, what is the choice of the points X alpha and Y alpha? Ah, the choice is to verify this limit statement right here. So how are they chosen then, I guess? So that they satisfy this limit or what? Yeah, they're just chosen so they satisfy this limit. That's all the information we have. Okay, so they lie in the closure of O, I guess. They do. Um, the idea is that eventually, uh, eventually, when we have a compact set, we're going to be able to say that X alpha and Y alpha are going to be inside of O as long as alpha is large enough. You can say that when you have compactness and uh, and also some kind of comparison on the boundary. But without those things, we don't know for sure. That's actually why, and that's a, a good point that we'll come back to in a little bit. That's why when I get to my second outcome of this lemma, I say anytime X naught is a limit point of X alpha, and it happens to be inside O, because if you don't have that, then mm, this last statement isn't so good. But if you've got it as a limit point in the interior of O, then this last uh, outcome works just fine. Muy bueno. Okay, excellent. So as a consequence of this, we know that limit of alpha converges. So I'll write it this way. And this is important to us because I know that if I take M alpha over two, let's say for some fixed alpha, and I subtract M alpha like this, there are two things coming out of this. First of all, as alpha goes to infinity, this should go to zero. And based upon what we said at the very beginning, M alpha over two minus M alpha is going to have to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so why is this useful to us? Well, as a consequence, looking at M alpha over two for a second, I know that M alpha over two is greater than or equal to what happens when I take U of X alpha. You'll notice that the index here does not match. I'm doing that on purpose. Minus V of Y alpha minus alpha over two over two, the distance between X alpha and Y alpha squared. I'm doing this because I want a comparison between M alpha over two and M alpha. You'll notice that the right-hand side of this inequality is almost, almost part and parcel of the M alpha definition. The real difference between this and M alpha, well, at least as far as limits are concerned, is the alpha over two here. Realistically, we really want it to be alpha, not alpha over two on top of this fraction. So I can expand it. In the interest of being lazy, I'm going to envelop U and V inside quotation marks. I'm gonna change this to alpha over two, the distance between X alpha and Y alpha squared. And then I'm just going to add alpha over two over two. the distance between X alpha and Y alpha squared. Still good? And 
And as long as my alpha is long enough, or is long enough, as long as our alpha be super long, it's tall, at least over six feet tall, because otherwise need not apply. It's a Tinder joke, Nathan. Come on, Nathan, really? Get your head in the game. Fine, fine, fine. Good joke. Thank you. But now it just feels like it's a, I don't know. I feel like I'm being patronized. So I'm going to be a petulant child now. Hey, Nathan, quiz. What's Tinder? <laughs> what quiz is that? <laughs> I, I mean, you, probably, you, you know better than me, probably. I'm just kidding. A box. Hey, Brittany, pointed quiz. Where were you a few minutes ago when I had to imitate you? Well, I was, um, I was told that my voice is obnoxious, so I, uh, I've been uh, passive aggressively staying quiet. <laughs> like a little, whoa. Like okay, a petulant, to, like like a a petulant, petulant child, child giving you yes. a little piece of your own medicine. Yes. Also, I was making tea, so okay. I decided not to run back into the room to say something. Okay, so intellectual yeah. and petulant child. That's at least a step up for me. Yeah, but uh, but if my voice is obnoxious, you know, I don't want to be disturbing anyone. <laughs> you know, that is super great. I'm glad. <laughs> okay. So hopefully everybody follows me up to here because I'm going to do the same sort of trick again. It's kind of like that weird um, messed up looking goofy meme here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, change this into... M alpha minus U of X alpha. Actually, oops, I can do this better. I can do this better. Oh, I'm so great. I'm so awesome. I just realized how awesome I am. You guys don't even know. Just wait until you see this. Just when we thought it couldn't get any better. <laughs> hey, at least I'm not being petulant right now, like some of us. <laughs> okay. I'm going to add and subtract M alpha, and I'm going to do that for a very specific reason. The clutter clogs way that I've written out what I've got here is going to translate into a nice little inequality when I finish writing everything down. Uh, let's see, this is, yes, alpha over two. There's so much to write here. I'm really glad I'm on an unending sheet of paper or purportedly unending sheet of paper because this would be a pain otherwise. I'd be killing a lot of trees. And this leads me to an inequality, the inequality I really wanted all along, M alpha plus alpha over four, absolute value of X alpha minus Y alpha squared plus, now here's the deal. I was saying a second ago something about alpha being sufficiently large. If alpha is sufficiently large, we already know from the limit up above, which is part of our assumptions, that M alpha minus all of that garbage goes to zero, or it's pretty darn close to zero. So that means here, it's actually going to be, I might as well put a negative sign here. This is going to be greater than or equal to negative some very small number, say um, epsilon, like that. And now I get to reorganize everything. I suspect that when the authors say that this is actually an elementary proof, they mean nothing here requires that much in the way of mathematics. You have to be on your toes and you have to be willing to write a lot. I'm not sure if I'm willing to call that elementary. Obnoxious maybe. But I don't think I would say that to their faces. <laughs> I like my career, my potential career, too much for that. Okay. This, at the end of the day, is why we care. If I reorganize all the things I wrote a second ago, just a little bit more nicely than I had, On the left-hand side, I can have two times M alpha over two minus M alpha plus some small number, small as I like, doesn't really matter. 
On the right hand side, I'll have alpha over two times the distance squared. And we know that all of this is greater than or equal to zero. Thing is, the left hand side, as we've already proven, is definitely going to go to zero because that epsilon there is really dependent upon alpha. In fact, if I wanted to keep things really kosher here, I'd put epsilon alpha here just to make sure everybody understands exactly why. I guess I will be that kosher man for you guys. Now I've done it. I've shown why I spent all that time fighting with my computer and why I spent all this time telling you obnoxious things like this theorem, this lemma. It's out of love. Aww. Nathan made the appropriate face there. Thank you, Nathan. All of this is going to tend to zero. So as a consequence of that, alpha over two, the distance between x alpha and y alpha squared also must tend to zero. This is the first thing we needed. I'm going to give a little pause here in all this obnoxious writing because I want to give you an idea of what this is doing for us. The authors are kind of scant on their intuition here. They provide some, but they're not necessarily keen on just throwing it out, like you might throw out kernels of something to pigeons, hopefully something that doesn't kill them like rice. What's going on is that when I know that alpha over two times the distance between x alpha and y alpha squared is going to zero, what I'm effectively saying is even though when I'm trying to estimate where the supremum of u minus v is in the set it has been complicated by adding in all this alpha business. Actually, the alpha business becomes less and less significant as alpha goes towards positive infinity. So this gives me hope that m alpha is actually eventually going to approximate the supremum fairly nicely. I had to complicate issues. I had to add in extra variables to make it happen. But it looks like I'm able to use this to conclude that it could still happen. And Brittany, I noticed you unmuted yourself. Oh, yes, because um, I appreciate your explanation. I mean, that made it much more clear. I agree 100%, both because I'm awesome and also because I know I spent a lot of time looking at it. You are awesome. I actually had to prove a version of this, I believe, as part of my third qualifying exam. So I had to know what I was doing. And it took some long nights reading this over and over again to be comfortable with it. Okay, so this is the first part of what we wanted to conclude and hopefully everybody agrees that it is done for right now. So now we've got to prove the second part. The second part, luckily, is really not so bad. So, Taking a limit as alpha goes to infinity yields. Well, let's see. I really want to know that the limit as alpha goes to infinity of m alpha is approximating the supremum. So I'm going to have to go back to my original expression. Uh, let me see. I already know that as the limit, as alpha goes to infinity, I may as well be talking about, I may as well be talking about, I guess I'm going to write it this way. Don't hate me. The limit as alpha goes to infinity of u of x alpha minus v of x alpha, uh, v of y alpha, my bad, minus alpha over two times the distance, which we just proved a second ago is going towards zero. They're basically the same. I could throw in the correct inequalities or the correct equalities to make this work, 
but we know they're basically the same because that's what the limit up above is telling us. So with this in mind, I can now start using the properties of the right-hand side. I already know that the limit of alpha over two, the distance squared goes to zero. So as alpha goes to infinity, I should be able to ignore that and just get rid of it. On the other hand, u of x alpha minus v of y alpha. Uh, actually, I think I need to reverse an inequality here. Because of upper, upper semi-continuity ought to be less than or equal to u at the limit as uh, alpha goes to infinity of x alpha minus v of the limit as alpha goes to infinity of y alpha. Now, I'm not gonna claim that this is the nicest way to talk about this thing because it kind of looks like I'm saying the limit should be able to go inside. And obviously we know that's not one of my assumptions. I haven't said that's actually true. But what I have said is true is that if I have an upper semi-continuous function f, if I have a sequence of points xn that are going towards a point x naught, and I take the limit as n goes to infinity, then what should happen is this should be less than or equal to f of the point of convergence like that. That's part of my upper semi-continuity properties. And that's what I've used here. This is where we're going to need the existence of the limit point, because I can't really bring that limit inside unless I've got a limit point. Everybody good with this so far? Okay, I'm throwing a thumbs up at my camera, but my camera isn't looking at me right now, so it doesn't do any good. I'm still doing it anyway. This is why I told my students I'm cool-ish. So this is all okay. As long as I have existence of the limit point x naught for x alpha. And as per usual in a lot of analysis arguments, if you look at this and you think to yourself, well, that's weird. Why are we able to just move to the limit point from the sequence x alpha, move to a subsequence if necessary? I won't write it here, but hopefully everybody's thinking it. If it doesn't work for all of x alpha, move to a subsequence of alphas. But I also know that if x naught is the limit point of x alpha, the limit of x alpha for our purposes, I know that if I let both x and y be x naught, then from our definitions, u of x naught minus v of x naught is less than or equal to m alpha for every single alpha. So what have we got here? Well, we've got kind of a three-way inequality. U of x naught minus V of x naught must be less than or equal to the limit as alpha goes to infinity of M alpha. And on the other hand, it must be less than or equal to uh, u of x naught minus v of x naught on the other hand, because of what we wrote above. And this concludes the proof. And just to be extra pretentious, I'm actually going to conclude it with QED. You could write out quad era demonstratum just to be like. <laughs> I'm snobbish, not suicidal. <laughs> 
besides, I need to rest my hand up so tomorrow I can use a sword properly. For LARPing? Yes, for LARPing with actual steel where I've been hit in the face with a shield and it actually hurts, Brittany. Thank I was, you. I was joking for a second and then I remembered that last week, I think it was last week, you mentioned that you do actually not LARP. You you guys use real weapons and stuff, but it's definitely not LARPing. Oh, it's LARPing. It's so totally LARPing. Oh, man. Called out my video. Oh, look, the petulant child is back. <laughs> All right. We have exploded this proof, so I think now we're ready to put it behind us. We don't have to consider this anymore. So now I have a few remarks that I think are worth talking about. So the first thing is something that I was saying to Nathan before. If it turns out that omega is the set we're talking about, and it's a bounded subset of Rn, then we know that all of the conditions of our lemma are going to be met, so long as I assume that u is less than or equal to v on the boundary. Because in a circumstance like that, if there is some point of maximum, yeah, and probably, especially if we assume the point of maximum u minus v is going to be a positive, then it's going to be somewhere on the interior. It shouldn't be on the boundary. Uh, also here, and this kind of leads into what I was saying a second ago, so let me go ahead and circle it. Two really leads into what I was saying a second ago, or leans into it. It does something that involves L. I'm going to eventually want to assume that u of x naught or u of x is greater than v of x somewhere inside of our uh, domain. I'm going to want to show that's a contradiction. So what's going to happen is by using the maximum principle, I'm going to be able to find these points x alpha, y alpha that are on the inside of uh, omega eventually, and they get closer and closer and closer to the supremum of u of x naught minus v of x naught or u of x minus v of x. There is, however, a very important problem here that we haven't talked about yet. I keep talking about how we're going to get to a contradiction, but we actually have to have our full toolbox if we want a contradiction. And the fact of the matter is here, we haven't actually said that at any of those points of maximum, or even at the point of the supremum of u minus v, that there is going to be non-empty jets. It is totally possible without further investigation that at each of the points x alpha and y alpha, and at the point x naught, where I am just going to say for now the supremum occurs, there are empty jets only. And if there are empty jets only, then we're not going to reach a contradiction because vacuously we have functions that are satisfying our uh, uh, viscosity sub and super solution inequalities. So we need more. We need to be able to actually produce jet entries of some kind. And it turns out that that actually is going to require a brand new definition, a new tool, jet closures. It's worth mentioning here the jet closures because they're not exactly what you would expect. Normally, it would just be the jet and then all of the uh, limit points of the jet. That would be our standard definition. But in fact, I'm requiring much more from the uh, from Deem. I require much more from Deem than I normally would. This is my normal voice. I'm going to require that there are not just points of closure, but actually, moreover, that I can find points xn and vectors eta n and matrices xn so that eta n and xn belong to the jet for u at each of the points xn. And moreover, as n goes toward infinity, the triple xn, eta n, xn goes to x naught, eta x. Technically speaking, that's cheating. It's definitely cheating for the standpoint of closures, but it's okay in our setting because remember that our function f is continuous. So that means as long as I have this underlying condition, if I take f of xn, u of xn, eta of n, 
capital XN, and I allow N to go to infinity, continuity guarantees that this is going to end up giving me X naught, U of X naught, eta X, like this. So I'll be able to carry through some of my inequality properties. This is what I really want from this definition. And that's exactly what this remark here says. It says that basically, anytime I take a jet closure, I can treat that exactly the same way in the viscosity sub and super solution definitions as I would the normal jet entries. In fact, in some works, you'll actually see that they don't use the jets themselves. Instead, they'll talk about jet closures only. I didn't realize that until I looked at a paper for the purposes of research one day, and I looked at the paper and went, well, that's wrong. This is obviously a typo, and Tom gave me a verbal slap and said, no, you fool. This is exactly how you define it. How did you not know that? And I felt dumb. So today I feel smarter. And why did we introduce that? Well, because we need this horrible theorem of sums that Nathan reminisced about so fondly last time. And which I mentioned last time, I'm not going to bother to prove because frankly, I don't know the proof off the top of my head. I would have to spend a lot more time going through the details to be able to even hope to present the proof to you. And realistically, it's not super important to understand exactly how this proof works apart from the words horribly and dumpster fire. What's important to know is that as we find functions that look like W here, which I'm going to point out, sums of upper semi-continuous functions. And as I find points of maximum for the functions W, the sum of upper semi-continuous functions minus C2 functions, then I can guarantee that for every single epsilon greater than zero, which is a technical thing, there are going to be matrices Xi, so that as long as I take the gradient of my semi or my uh, second uh, differentiable function phi with respect to the correct variable, and I put it in an ordered pair with the matrix Xi, it belongs to the jet closure for the function Ui, which you see in the sum here. And very similarly important, uh, equally important, is this bound here on the matrices. You need to have this because in a little while, we're going to be employing a version of this for our proof of the comparison theorem. It's not obvious where this is coming from. So my suggestion is don't try to sit down and come up with some intuitive reason why it comes out to be this way. Frankly, I don't have an intuition to give you here. The most important thing to understand is the points of maximum that you get from taking the sum of upper semi-continuous functions minus my C2 function are nicely behaved enough that for every single epsilon, I can guarantee that the matrix, which treats each of my other matrices in, as entries in block form of this huge overarching matrix, ends up being bounded. This is going to be useful in a little bit, which is really good because the appropriate question when you see a theorem like this is to say, but why do we care? How do we employ the theorem of sums in our context? This is kind of a detailed answer. I'll leave it dangling on my page like a spider right over your sleeping face. And instead, I'll give you an intuitive understanding. So we already know, Nathan was talking about this previously, if I take an upper semi-continuous function and I subtract a lower semi-continuous function, I've got another upper semi-continuous function. Actually, even better, changing colors here just to show how fancy I am, the negative of a lower semi-continuous function is an upper semi-continuous function. We've talked about that lots of times. Yes, last time. Lots of times last time. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> So what this actually means is we have upper semi-continuous function plus upper semi-continuous function, which looks like our W function, our sum of upper semi-continuous functions from before. Alpha over two, the distance squared, is the C2 function that we're going to be using. 
It has nice derivatives. It fits directly into what we want to do. And it works nicely with the maximum principle, which means it's going to give us all sorts of really great points for each alpha where we have a maximum. As long as those maximum points are on the interior, and as long as we have something to wend towards, to converge towards in the center of our set, what's going to happen is we're going to eventually have x alpha and y alpha converge to x naught. And at each of the points, x alpha and y alpha, we have non-empty jet closures. That is what we need in order to make this work. I wish I could say it was all that we need, but there are a couple more technical considerations. Viscosity theory is one of those theories that really adhere to the smash mouth principle. It starts coming and it don't stop coming and it don't stop coming and it don't stop coming. We need conditions, more conditions, more things. Thing one, we need a lower bound. We need to be able to guarantee that if I take my operator acting on U and I subtract it at two different points, well, for two different values here, here and here, then I should be able to bound it below by gamma times the, dis uh, the distance, the difference between S and R. First thing. So is this equivalent to asking something like uniformly elliptic in the linear case? I think it is. I think you're exactly right. It's not exactly uniformly elliptic, but it's the same sort of rule, I believe. And that's a very good point. I hadn't made that connection, but I, I think you're 100% right. The next thing is we need an upper bound, which looks a lot uglier. But this upper bound is going to be the thing that really saves our bacon here. We need to assume that there is a function theta. Theta behaves like this. It goes from zero to infinity to zero to infinity. It goes towards zero as t goes towards zero from the right. And it does this as long as we have this condition right here fulfilled. And hopefully when you look at this condition, you think to yourself- It looks familiar somehow. It looks familiar somehow. Hopefully you're Brittany and you think to yourself, this looks familiar. Why does this look familiar? Well. Cast your mind back to all those eons ago when we looked at theorem of sums, and you'll notice we had a three-part matrix inequality. This three-part matrix inequality is exactly the same as this matrix three-part inequality, as long as, as long as when you talk about a C2 function, what you really mean is alpha over two, the distance between X alpha and y alpha, well, x, I really should say x and y here, to be totally cricket, to be cricket. Am I might have to close this after I made that stupid British accent? Squared, as long as you assume that your penalty function phi, which is what we typically call it, is this, then you get exactly this three-way inequality from the theorem of sums. Okay, I pushed off proof of the theorem of sums because I felt like instead we should prove what's coming next, the comparison principle. It's what we've really been working toward this whole time. Everything else that we have is really icing on the cake, the cherry on top, the icing on the cherry, I don't know, some really nice thing. Comparison principle, if F is continuous, proper, and degenerate elliptic, if omega is a bounded open set, so it can be a domain, although it doesn't have to be, if u is upper semi-continuous and a viscosity subsolution, v is lower semi-continuous and a viscosity super solution, and we know that u is less than or equal to v on the boundary of omega, as long as f satisfies those lower and upper bound conditions that we just showed a second ago, then we can conclude that u is less than or equal to v on all of omega, not just on the boundary, but on the inside too. So not to rush you or anything, but let's make this the last theorem. We're already over time, so. That's cool. That or, actually means, uh, that's perfect because all of the stuff that comes after this is, what are the comparisons with say weak solutions? Uh, what is Perron's method in our case? And how about parabolic problems? And if you want, I can do a third part talk. I was gonna, I was gonna say, uh, you know, if, if you're going to continue 
um, it, it was really good last time, the sort of like intuitive overview of the next section that you were going to do that was, you know, then I don't know how anyone else feels. Then let's do this proof really quickly. In fact, I don't think I need to explode it quite as much as the previous one. So fewer explosions, more expositions. We'll go over this and then we'll move on to the next couple of sections to give you an idea of where we're headed. Okay, so we're going to do exactly what I've hinted and what I boldly stated we're going to be doing all along. We're going to assume that there is some interior point x naught where u of x naught minus v of x naught is the supremum and it's greater than zero. So if we do that, and if we employ the maximum principle and the theorem of sums, which applies here, what we're going to find out is that the function u minus v minus alpha over two x minus y squared is going to have maximums they're going to be at the points given to us by the maximum principle, x alpha and y alpha. And as long as alpha is large enough, because they're going to be moving towards the maximum of u minus v, which is on the inside of the set, there is not a chance that y alpha and x alpha are staying on the boundary. Eventually, they have to go inside the set as well. So for our purposes, we're just going to assume they are inside. It doesn't make any difference. All that matters is they're going to be there eventually. From that, what we're going to be able to do is conclude that we're going to get jet entries, well, jet closure entries that look like this. The gradient portion comes directly from the derivatives of our nicely chosen function phi, alpha over two, the distance squared. And x and y, unfortunately, we don't have lots of control over them. All we know is how they get bounded. They, in particular, conform to the inequality 2.2, which I'll remind you is the one that kind of looks like three times alpha times something is less than or equal to x, zero, zero, I on y, the diagonals and less the, than or equal to. Yeah, exactly. And then over here, it's like it's minus alpha. y, I think, in the middle. Yeah, it should be minus y. You're right. And then here it should be, I want to say, I zero zero I. Yeah. And this is like I negative I yeah. negative I I like that. Something, yeah. But it turns out this is going to be enough information to get what we want. It's probably just about the least information that we could hope for that will give us what we want. Because once I start looking at the difference of F with itself, and all I'm doing is I'm replacing. Uh, the coordinate by x alpha and y alpha here. On the one hand, because it meets the conditions, the uh, lower and upper bounds from before, it must be greater than or equal to this. And you'll notice as alpha goes toward infinity, since x alpha and y alpha go towards x naught, this must be positive eventually. On the other hand, because of the upper bound, the difference must also be less than or equal to this. It turns out that because of this, if we allow alpha to go towards infinity, on the one hand, this chunk, gamma times the difference of the two functions, is going to have to go to gamma times delta. I think I erroneously said alpha delta here. I think I really mean gamma delta. And on the other hand, theta is going to have to go towards zero because everything inside of theta is going towards zero. So that means that we wind up with the stupid statement, zero is less than a positive times a positive is less than or equal to zero. That is not possible. Therefore, we have a contradiction and it must follow that u is less than or v equal to everywhere inside of omega. And I guess this is a good place to start doing the fast forward. We have a desirable corollary, which is so long as we have two solutions in the viscosity sense and they're equal on the boundary, then they must be identical. And one of the ways that you can end up in a situation like this is by finding dis uh, viscosity solutions of a Dirichlet type problem. And if you're not sure what the Dirichlet type problem means, I mean this.
Okay, so this is good for right now. So let's see, where are we headed next time? Uh, let's see, I think, okay, so the next time around, we're going to be talking about other notions of solutions. Really, this section maybe sounds a little bit more vast than it actually is. Mostly what we're going to be talking about is distributional solutions, weak solutions. We talked about them last time. We'll go over the details next time, but they are functions which happen to satisfy, come on, don't slow down here, an, uh, an integral equation that looks like this. And it's the result of, to spoil a little bit of what we're going to do next time, taking our desired PDE and multiplying it by what's called a test function and then integrating. Then we get to use things like integration by parts and everything comes out to be all hunky-dory. It's gonna turn out that while we don't have uh, this answer for every space and for every problem, there are a large number of papers published about the circumstances in which weak and viscosity solutions are the same, some of which have been published by Tom and Bob, and others of which come from other jerks you can see on this list, some of whom are actually cool people. We're also going to talk about uh, P, superharmonic, and subharmonic, because I felt like if I'm going to say notions, I better have plural notions of solution. So we're gonna have some for the P Laplacian. Uh, we're also gonna talk about Perron's method. Basically Perron's method answers the question, okay, so if we have viscosity solutions, we can compare them under the right circumstances. Do we have viscosity solutions at all? Can we find some? Perron's is going to give us conditions under which we can find viscosity solutions. And then the very last section, which you'll notice I have not finished yet because I'm a horrible slacker, is going to be talking about parabolic solutions. And in here, basically what we're going to do is find out that if I add a, an evolution term, a time term to my, para, my degenerate elliptic proper continuous operators, it's going to turn out that basically viscosity theory doesn't change that much. There are some important changes. The theorem of sums in particular has a brand new uh, condition, which is technical. And frankly, I do not understand. I don't make the rules, I just work here. But the theory otherwise is very, very similar. And there you go, everything I want to say, at least everything I want to say on camera. Excellent, well, so does anyone have any questions? I have one, if no one else does. Not off the top of my head, no. So I'll ask my quick, quick question then. So does the, this whole technique work for systems of nonlinear general equations? So if you have a system of, um, say functions and uh, well, a system of nonlinear equations which happen to have this degenerate elliptic type behavior. Can you say anything? I think the answer to that is yes. Um, I would not have been able to answer that before, let's say this morning, just to show you what kind of person I am. But I happened to be going through the user's guide again to get prepared. And I noticed that there was something talking about systems of equations, I think. So I believe if you go look at the user's guide, you'll find an answer. If not, that would be worth talking about afterward um, at some point in the future. Probably not today, because I don't think I'd be that useful. Okay. Did, did you already send us uh, your, your slides from last time? I sent copies of the printout for the first couple of sections to Nathan. Um, I can send out more printouts now. I kind of don't want to send the full thing simply because you're going to get to section five and then get the word high and nothing else. But if you would like a printout of what we've covered, I'd be more than happy to give you that. Yes, please. Um, if you don't mind. Yeah, I don't mind at all. Okay, so any other questions? No, I just think that it was it was cool. I like the, I like it. I like where it's going. Good. Okay, so I'm gonna, well, let's thank our speaker one more time. Yeah. And uh, I'm gonna stop recording.